Hello, welcome to a new series of The Bookworm. And this week we're in the Midlands, the first home of the author of the nation's favourite book, The Lord of the Rings. Also the Nazi who became the Dalai Lama's best friend. The extraordinary story of Heinrich Harrer. Of course, when I met the Dalai Lama, I had deeply regretted that I had been part of that system before the war. As Roald Dahl's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory reaches 30, we trace its rocky road to success. We didn't realise we should get all sorts of uh, frozen letters from uh, lady librarians all around the country saying that they could not have this book on their shelves. And we'll be launching a hunt for the nation's favourite children's book. J.R.R. Tolkien's rich tale of hobbits and elves and wizards and the like recently beat David Copperfield and Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice and even the complete works of Shakespeare in a poll of 50,000 readers to become the nation's favourite book of all time. It weighs in at a hefty thousand pages long. So, what makes it so popular? The Lord of the Rings is the greatest fairy tale that's ever been written. It's also a heroic story whose heroes are not heroes, but hobbits. And it's a fable from modern times about the frustration of the Dark Lord by the destruction of the One Ring of Power. The main character is Frodo. He's like the hero. Frodo is a small little hobbit who lives in the Hobbiton. Gandalf is the sorcerer who is a friend of uh, Frodo and who helps Frodo along the way. Frodo's been set with the task of taking the ring and destroying it. And the only way to do this is to go on a long quest to the volcano where it was first forged and throw it in. Three rings for the elven kings under the sky. Seven for the dwarf lords in their halls of stone. Nine for mortal men doomed to die. One for the dark lord on his dark throne. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all and in the darkness bind them in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. Spellbinding stuff. But where do we look for the origins of that extraordinary imaginary fantasy world that Tolkien created? Well, not surprisingly in Middle Earth, but here in the Midlands, in that sprawling city beyond the car factory where Tolkien spent a troubled childhood. John Ronald Rule Tolkien arrived in Birmingham at the age of three to stay with relatives and to get away from the scorching heat of South Africa, where he'd been born in 1892. With him were his mother, Mabel, and younger brother, Hilary. Their father, Arthur, was expected to join them from Africa, but died of a hemorrhage on the very day that Ronald wrote him his first letter. With no income and little help from her family, Mabel had to find affordable lodgings on the rural fringes of Birmingham. So this semi in the village of Serhol became their home for the next four years. Four years, Tolkien later recorded, as the happiest of his life. Serhol was the central inspiration for the Shire, the part of Middle-earth where the hobbits lived. Right, and a hobbit? Hobbits are small people, three to four feet high. They're quiet, shy people who don't like going on adventures, and they eat a lot. Right, and they live in villages. That's right, yes. Indeed. So what's the connection between Serhol and the village of Hobbiton? Tolkien himself said that the Shire, where the hobbits live, was based on a Warwickshire village, and in his picture of Hobbiton, the mill in Hobbiton looks just like Serhol Mill. Tolkien remembered Serhol Mill as a noisy, sinister place, and the miller, covered with the dust from the bones he ground to make glue, became the model for the traitor of the Shire. When the hobbits get back from the quest of the ring, they come back to the Shire and they find the whole thing's been made grimy and filthy and polluted, and the miller has somehow become an important person, and the whole of the Shire is being destroyed. Well, Tolkien, I think, saw that as an image of what 
had happened to places that he knew in his childhood, which had been taken over by, you know, industrial sprawl. When, at the age of eight, Tolkien won a place at his father's old school, the family were forced to move to the inner city. They were sad to leave the countryside, but the move had its rewards for their new home backed onto a railway line. It wasn't the trains which captured young Ronald's imagination, but the destinations painted on the coal trucks. Names he didn't know how to pronounce, but which held a fascination for him. Nantaglo, Plain Ronda, Chediga. This was the beginning of Tolkien's love of Welsh, the inspiration for the languages he later invented for Middle Earth. Languages have a flavor to me, which I, I never understand people saying, saying for instance, it was awfully dry and dull because a new language to me is, is just like taking a new wine or a new sweet beet or something. I first began seriously to invent languages about uh, when I was 13 or 14. I've never stopped, really. The Lord of the Rings is a map, but since Tolkien was a professor of languages, it's a map of languages. You have the hobbits in the Shire, they speak modern English. You have the dwarves to the east, they speak Old Norse. You have the riders of the Riddermark to the south, they speak Old English. There are other peoples and other languages, and the characters move across the map from one language group and from one people to another. A large part of the thrill of The Lord of the Rings is experiencing the languages and experiencing the cultures which those languages embody. Tolkien inherited his love of languages from his mother, who taught him French and Latin from the age of five. The latter was to take on more significance when the family converted to Catholicism, and Ronald and Hilary were introduced to the ritual of Latin Mass. Under the spiritual guardianship of Father Francis Morgan, the Birmingham Oratory became a second home. When Mabel contracted diabetes, Father Francis sent her to convalesce in a cottage near the Oratory retreat beside the Licky Hills. The boys were delighted to be in the countryside again, but their mother's health deteriorated. On November the 4th, 1904, Mabel died. Ronald, who was only 12, was devastated. If you really come down to any large story, it interests people, for, uh, can hold them attention for a considerable time, or, or make the, the stories practically always, a human story is practically always about one thing, aren't they? Death. Tolkien uh, knew much more about death than most people at an early age. His work is full of memorable death scenes. The Lord of the Rings has the death scenes of Boromir, Theoden, Denethor, and Aragorn. And yet, it seems to me that uh, The Lord of the Rings is about the conquering of death and going beyond temporality. The characters often express the hope that they can go to the undying lands, that they can go beyond the circles of the world. All that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wander are lost. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not reached by the frost. From the ashes a fire shall be woken. A light from the shadows shall spring. Renewed shall be blade that was broken. The crownless again shall be king. In the end, Perhaps it's not too fanciful to see The Lord of the Rings as Tolkien's own quest for the world of his lost childhood. A world of village life and dark woods and ritualised behaviour and secret languages, and above all, the trust and warmth he associated with his mother. Well, whatever, it still sells over five million copies a year. <laughs> My name is Julian Robinson and I'm a viola player with the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra. The book that I'm rereading at the moment is a travel book by a writer called Patrick Lay Fermer called A Time of Gifts. When he was 19, in 1933, he walked from the Hook of Holland to Constantinople. It's a fascinating read because he moves seamlessly from talking about the people he meets to the places he's at, the art and architecture that's there and the history of the places. One night you can be sort of with him in a barn somewhere in Germany, and the next day he's in a schloss on the Rhine talking to the people who live there. I find it a deeply satisfying read and a great true story. In 
1943, Heinrich Harrer, an Austrian mountaineer, escaped from a British prisoner of war camp in India and fled into Tibet. He was one of the first Westerners to visit the Forbidden City, and he wrote a book, Seven Years in Tibet. It became a bestseller, and now it's going to be made into a film starring Brad Pitt. It's a remarkable rites of passage story. One young man's journey from Nazi party member to a champion of an oppressed people. Heinrich Harrer was born in Austria in 1912. He became a brilliant mountaineer and was a member of the first party to climb the north face of the Eiger. He was also a national ski champion and in 1938 became coach to the ski team of the local SS. The following year, he was on a German expedition to the Himalayas when war broke out and he was interned by the British in northern India. For me, it was from the very first day clear that I would like to get away from this prison camp and I wanted to go to somewhere, I wanted to read something. And there was the famous story that there was the last mystery on earth was uh, Tibet on the roof of the world with a uh, god king living up there. So it was for me uh, clear uh, that uh, my intention was to escape from the pub via across the Himalayas to reach this country of mystery. Together with his companion, Peter Aufschneider, he succeeded in escaping on the third attempt and they headed over the Himalayas and into Tibet. It was a journey that was to take them almost two years. Uh, there were, of course, moments when we were prepared to give up. When we had blisters and when we had frozen feet and hand and ears, it was 40 below zero centigrade, below zero. And then in the evening when we saw our feet, Aufschneider and we said, well, we better give up uh, before we lose our uh, feet and so. But interesting, in the morning, you know, when we had rested, nobody mentioned anything of going back, you see, or giving up. Finally, at the beginning of 1946, they reached Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, a city forbidden to foreigners. It was unknown that there was a 2,000-year-old culture existing. And then we came into monastery, there were woodwork, metalwork, bronzes, paintings, and incredible treasures there were in every monastery. So we, we learned already from the Tibetans that they are different than what the whole world knew about Tibet. The Dalai Lama, the living Buddha, was just a child at the time but was the heart of the concentrated faith of thousands. In the spring, he would leave the Potala Palace for his summer residence in a gorgeous procession. Pilgrims from the remotest parts of Tibet would undergo countless hardships in order to witness, for once in their lives, this brilliant manifestation of their religious faith. First came servants carrying the God King's personal effects then I heard the unmistakable sound of the British National Anthem. I learned later that the band leader had been trained by the British in India and had taken a liking to the tune. When we stayed in Tibet, we would have loved to stay on all the rest of our life. You, must, you know, we were, I think you call it jack of all trades. Whenever there was a Western idea to be carried out, we could help the Tibetans. We were asked, we were, we were needed, you see. And, you know, the, the, the life in Tibet was a happy-go-lucky life. One day in midwinter, Hara decided to teach the monks of the Holy City how to skate. The 13-year-old Dalai Lama was watching from a window high above and summoned Hara to his palace. It was the beginning of an extraordinary relationship. Then he said to me, if I were a normal boy, I would also be down there. You are very naughty with, with my friends down there. The government doesn't like what you are doing. You are very... But, you know, I, if I would be free, I would be naughty as you. But in 1950, the era was shattered when the Chinese People's Liberation Army invaded and destroyed the ancient kingdom of Tibet. They desecrated the monasteries, and the Dalai Lama was forced into exile. Harrow went with him, and has remained on close terms with him ever since, and has done much to help the Tibetan people in their fight against the oppressive Chinese regime. It's hard to imagine that this is the same man who started out as a Nazi sympathizer and ski coach 
to the SS. It's getting cold down your spine when you think that you have met this fellow, the Hitler, or that they have given you a job and you had joined uh, them, you see. On my way to Laos, which took already years, and my seven years in Tibet changed my mind. And I realized that uh, what I had been doing before was wrong. And so at that time, of course, when I met the Dalai Lama, I had deeply regretted that I had been part of that system before the war. I follow all that happens in Tibet with the deepest interest. For part of my being is indissolubly linked with that dear country. Wherever I live, I shall feel homesick for Tibet. I often think I can still hear the wild cries of geese and cranes as they fly over Lhasa in the clear, cold moonlight. I'm Bill Graham and uh, I run an education centre here at the Botanical Gardens. The story that I've just finished is called Wit by Ian Banks. It's a really good story because it takes the view of an innocent Isis who is elect of a small quirky religion. She's sent out amongst the unsaved to look for Morag who's decided to renounce the faith. And as an innocent, she starts seeing life for the first time. And as she does, she starts discovering the deceit and double standards of society. I really like this book. It, it's tremendous. It's very, very funny. And at the same time, it makes you want to look and question society again. Ian Banks is very good at being able to take life and tease away the layers so that you see the darker side. This year, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Roald Dahl's famous book, is 30 years old. It's a rather savage story, with children drowning in chocolate and being hurled down rubbish chutes by squirrels and turning into blueberries. So as you can imagine, it's very, very popular with children. For adults, though, it's a different story. Walking to school in the mornings, Charlie could see great slabs of chocolate piled up high in the shop windows, and he would stop and stare and press his nose against the glass, his mouth watering like mad. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was the second book that Roald Dahl wrote for children, and it tells how five lucky characters win the chance to spend a day at Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory and what happens to them. Greedy Augustus Gloop, spoilt Veruca Salt, the disgusting gum-chewing Violet Beauregard, Mike TV the Telly Addict, and Charlie, a poor boy with a heart of gold, meet the factory owner, Mr Willy Wonka, who makes sure that the four obnoxious children come to a rather sticky end. The book was first published in America in 1964 but it was to be turned down by countless British publishers before going on sale in Britain three years later. My children were at school with Roald Dahl's children, and one day one of my girls brought back uh, a book that one of Roald Dahl's girls had lent her. It was the American edition of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And uh, my daughter was absolutely delighted by it, and I looked over her shoulder and uh, I thought it was great fun too. We published it a little innocently, perhaps. We thought it was just a good book. We didn't realize we should get all sorts of uh, frozen letters from uh, lady librarians all around the country saying that they could not have this book on their shelves. It doesn't, in fact, uh, tell children that uh, the grown-ups are always right. It doesn't make the children always uh, conform to grown-ups' opinions. And this was unusual in those days. Children are far cruder and more basic than, and they're not so civilized as adults are. And therefore you, you, you feed them a, a, a different, different read altogether. Uh, something that will shock an adult, won't shock a child at all, roar with laughter at it. And I know, I think, what those things are. 
Uh, some adults don't. I knew about Mr. Willy Wonka, and I knew he was a sort of picturesque figure, but I didn't realize how naughty he was. Roald himself was very naughty. He loved winding people up and teasing them. And I think this is the only book where there is someone actually doing that in the book, which I found fascinating. But the book became controversial in other ways, too. In its original form, Willy Wonka's workers, the Oompa Loompas, were described as little black pygmies from deepest Africa. But this became increasingly unacceptable, and in 1973, Dahl changed them into tiny people with rosy white skin and long golden brown hair. But Quentin Blake, the book's most recent illustrator, wanted to reinvent them for himself. They're little tiny people. They work with... Uh, Willy Wonka, and they seem to be, to me, to be really part of the of, of the of the mischief in the book. And in the book, it says they've got, um, I think it says they've got long hair or something of that of that kind. Um, and of course, you naturally think of it as sort of flowing down. I thought it would look more mischievous. It would give the sort of spirit of their naughtiness if I if I made it stand up like that, so their hair is standing on end. From far away along the corridor came the beating of drums. Then the singing began again. Faruka Salt sang the Oompa Loompas. Faruka Salt, the little brute, has just gone down the garbage chute. And as we very rightly thought that in a case like this we ought to see the thing completely through, we've polished off her parents too. Comparing Charlie and the naughty children, I prefer the naughty children because they're more realistic and most children are greedy in some t at some point in their lives and so are most people in fact. Young children don't really understand the moral but it teaches them something and when you're older you can understand the moral and it's a good story as well. I think Wardar um, really understands children because the way he writes it you can relate to the children can't you? I mean, because you understand what it's like, you just want, want, want. I think people are always going to like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. They like it as, just as much as, as they did. Children still like sweets and chocolates. They, they like naughty things happening. They like these extraordinary naughty children. There's also still something that I can't quite explain. That is, I know that it's very successful, and I can understand that, but I think there's still some extra bit of magic or something mysterious that Roald Dahl always seems to be able to do, and that I just can't quite explain. Well, something must have inspired him to write about chocolate, so I think he liked a little nibble here and there. When I was a child, that's my favourite books, were the Doctor Doolittle books. And I mentioned this to my son, George, who's 12 the other day, and he looked at me with a rather adult look and said he wasn't really into books about talking animals, which I thought was pretty rich, considering he spends so much time reading Brian Jakes. But anyway, throughout this series of The Bookworm, both adults and children will be able to vote for their favourite children's book. Recent bestsellers for children have included some hair-raising goosebumps from R.L. Stein, Dick Kingsmith's Little Porker Babe, and the question that everyone was asking, Where's Wally? by Martin Hanford. Or if your tastes are a little on the dark side, maybe you'll vote for Melvin Burgess's Junk, a story of drug-dependent youngsters. At the end of August, we'll be announcing the results of our poll to find out the nation's favourite children's book, and we'd like you to take part. You can find voting details in any Waterstones shop, or you can register your vote by phone. Tell us the title and the author of your choice, and let us know whether you're over or under 16. The number is 0891 treble 5 300. That's 0891 555 300. And the calls will cost no more than 25 pence. Or you can write to us at the nation's favourite children's book, Room E304, BBC Television Centre, London, W12, 7RJ. My name's Heli Beckford and I go to Sally Park School and I'm 11 years old. I have recently read the story Twin Trouble by Jacqueline Wilson. It's about an eight-year-old girl called Connie and her mother has just had twins. But Connie is extremely jealous of the twins and doesn't like them being around until a maternity nurse arrives and places a couple of blue magical beads in her hair. 
and every time they clink together, anyone around her becomes a double. This causes major trouble for Connie, so gradually she learns to appreciate Ollie having one set of twins in her family. I like this story because the storyline is hilarious and it helps me not to be selfish to my brother who is a recent member to the family and teaches you that your parents have to adjust to a new baby as well as you do. Well, there we are. Next week, I'll be talking to Richard Maybe about the history of wildflowers, and Sebastian Folkes is off to France on the trail of Kipling's unknown soldier. We leave this week with a poem from A.E. Houseman. It was written just behind me in Shropshire, and I think it proves that even the greatest writers sometimes use a little poetic licence. The vein on Hewley steeple veers bright, a far-known sign. And there lie Hewley people, and there lie friends of mine. Tall in their midst, the tower divides the shade and sun, and the clock strikes the hour and tells the time to none. To south, the headstones cluster, the sunny mounds lie thick. The dead are more in muster at Hewley than the quick. North, for a soon-told number, chill graves the sexton delves and steeple-shadowed slumber, the slayers of themselves. We get a considerable number of visitors to the area who are very keen on Hausman and anxious to track down all the places mentioned in the Shropshire lab. We've never ever had a steeple. We have got a very nice tower, but we think that Hausman just must needed a word to rhyme with people, so he, he landed with steeple. Hausman used real place names for romantic colouring rather than because he had a particular feeling for at the place. Well, Hausman talks about the clock striking the hours and telling the time to nobody. Well, the clock hasn't worked for years here and still doesn't tell the time, so I think that's quite, uh, quite apt for today. North, for a soon-told number, chill graves the sexton delves, and steeple-shadowed slumber the slayers of themselves. The graves to the south here there for the people who died normal, shall we say, respectable deaths, as distinct from those who lie to the north, who kill themselves by their own hand. And, but I think the Shropshire lad, in writing this poem, was, to him, there was no distinction between them. I think it sounds like a houseman walking through the graveyard and thinking at the same time because it's got a rhythm and a constant beat. The vein on Hewley steeple bears bright a far known sign, and there lie Hewley people, and there lie friends of mine. To north to south lie parted, with Hewley tower above. The kind, the single hearted, the lads I used to love. And south or north tis only, a choice of friends one knows, and I shall ne'er be lonely, asleep with these or those.